Letitia Trower, thank you so much for joining us on Highest Aspirations. Oh, Steve, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, me too. You know, we had you um, kind of uh, join us, not kind of, you did join us on Impact last year, the conference that we had, that that uh, that remote virtual conference that we'll be doing again this year. And we're excited to have you back in a kind of a different format here. Yeah, I'm really excited to be talking with you more about um, the work that I've been doing and also about what teachers and schools and districts can do um, to help multilingual learners, especially in this phase. I don't want to call it post-pandemic, but in this pandemic phase, I guess, or after the first initial shutdown of the pandemic, you know, how do we move forward in this new environment now? Yeah, this kind of murky phase. It's funny because I was looking over at some of the questions that I had for you, and I don't know if I, I can, know if I can use post anymore, which it's just this kind of weird phase. But um, but let's let's start off on a positive note here. So wh what do you think, and we're going to kind of focus on, we're going to talk about a lot of things, we're going to focus on kind of PD and what teachers can do to support their multilingual learners and what PD they have accessible to them and what good PD looks like. What do you think is going well um, in that kind of area, particularly as it pertains to um, supporting multilingual learners? Great question, yes. And I think murky phase is the best thing for it because I think, you know, Every semester since the beginning of the pandemic has come with new challenges and sometimes we anticipated them and sometimes we didn't, but we were never really emerging back into what we had before, right? And in some ways, there are some positives there. I mean, just like um, so many things happened during the pandemic that we were sort of forced to do, but then because of that, we had the experience, we learned from it. So one thing that I do think is going very well for teachers of multilingual learners right now is that virtual PD is much more available than it was in the past, whether that is um, something that is free that a teacher has found on their own, or whether that is something that your school or district has purchased and brought in but there is a lot more virtual PD available to teachers of multilingual learners right now. Another thing is that I think we've learned to be more flexible and more agile, again, because we had to be, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the beginning or, or in that first semester after um, the pandemic started when we had some students in school, some students at home, some students going back and forth depending on the COVID situation. We really had to be flexible and agile and that wasn't necessarily a pleasant experience, but we've all learned from it. And so now I think a lot of teachers and also a lot of school systems, schools and districts are prepared to be more flexible and more agile. Another thing that I think is a really positive note is that a lot of students' families and students' educators are much more engaged with each other. Again, yep. that came out of what we had to do when schools had to, you know, physical schools had to shut down. School had to move to remote learning one way or the other. Um, and it's really uh, invited families in in more ways than we saw in the past because we just needed family involvement. And now, again, because we had to, we have more options for families to engage, whether that is, you know, virtual meetings for parents of students being a little more available um, or just teachers working alongside students, family members a lot more. So I think those are three main areas of positives that we've seen that come as a direct result of some of the disruption that we experienced with the pandemic. Yeah, I'm glad we started there. And I appreciate you kind of outlining those three, because I think they are big ones. Um, and sort of the through line there is, is some kind of flexibility, right? The ability to approach things from a different way that's more convenient for everybody involved. And also, the fact that we had no choice meant that people had to do it. And then they were kind of forced to see some of the benefits of it. Whereas before, you know, you kind of use the old muscle memory, what, what we've been doing forever, we'll just keep doing it. And that I think well, those three things will kind of and that hopefully that asset based um, thinking, which we'll get to a little bit later, will help set up a foundation for this rest of this conversation. With all of those um, improvements, or at least kind of beginnings, right, of maybe some some more permanent changes. What are still some areas um, that we need to improve in, in, in PD as it's related to supporting multilingual learners and the teachers that serve them? Great question, Steve. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the improvement that I'd still like to see in schools is the same as before the pandemic. Um, some of these areas ha are, have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Others, maybe we've made a little improvement on, but really the areas where we need improvement are the same as they always have been. Number one, I'm going to say our students need more opportunities to speak. 
So if we think about math, you know, if I told you that I had a math teacher that was going to go into a classroom and do math in front of students and talk about math to students, but the students were not going to do math themselves, we would all agree that that would not be the best way to teach students how to do math and that they would learn something, but they wouldn't learn as much, <clears throat> excuse me, but they wouldn't learn as much as they should. Mm -hmm. Well, the same can be said of language, especially for our multilingual learners or any student that is still developing their language, right? If the teacher comes in and is doing all of the talking, and is using all of the vocabulary and is using all of the academic language structures, but students don't have opportunities to use that language in the classroom with that key vocabulary, with that academic sentence structure as much, then they're not going to learn as much. <clears throat> so we need to think about it like math, right? The teacher needs to do some and then the students need to practice, practice, practice. Um, and we've seen this come out in several schools and districts that I'm working with. I was actually just talking with a district recently that it had someone come in and do an audit. And one of their biggest findings was students do not have very many opportunities to speak during the school day. Um, and when we think about students at school, you know, even if they are talking, they're typically talking to their friends at lunch or in between classes. They're not really using that academic vocabulary, those academic varieties of English that we want our students using. So that's going to be the number one thing that I'd love to see improve in schools. Um, but we can also think about it. I like to break things down according to the domains of language, right? So you can listen, you can speak, you can read and you can write. And I'm gonna talk about some things that teachers can do to improve um, instruction, improve achievement from multilingual learners broken down according to those four. So first, listening. Listen to your students, <laughs> right? And this means listen to what they're telling you, but also listen to what they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. So you already mentioned an asset-based philosophy versus a deficit-based philosophy. And we can see this already in some of the terminology that we're using lately. You know, the new popular term is multilingual learners. And immediately prior to that, the most, most used term was English learners. So when we say English learners, we're focusing maybe on what was seen as most important because it's what we need to help the students attain or acquire. But we're also focusing on what they lack, right? They are English learners. They don't know English. Multilingual learners focuses on what they have. Mm -hmm. Not only are they needing to learn English, but they already speak at least one, maybe more than one other language. So that's one way that we can Think about listening to our students, right? Notice what they bring to the table, not just what they're lacking. And this goes beyond our multilingual students as well. If you have students who speak um, a certain variety of English that maybe is not as valued in the classroom or in the workforce beyond, um, instead of thinking about what they lack, oh, well, that student can't speak or doesn't speak or doesn't know a more standard variety of English, Instead, think about the fact that they come to school already speaking a language variety. They have that background, they're fluent in it, and let's add on to it, right? So the same way that we want our students speaking Spanish, if that's what they speak at home, we want to add English to it. For our English speaking students who don't speak another language, we really need to be thinking about them the same way, right? They speak a certain variety of English, or we can call it social English sometimes, they still need that in their lives, and we're going to add on a more standard variety of English to that that we want them to learn. So that's listening. Next, I would say speaking, and that's what we talked about a little bit already, right? How do you talk about your students? How do you refer to them? And I know we'll dig into this more deeply in a few minutes, but, um, you know, when you talk about your students, do you call them those students? Do you say, I have the low group? Mm -hmm. What are you saying? What are you communicating? And how does that impact you as the teacher, how does that impact your expectations for those students? And we know from research that a teacher's expectations can have a direct impact on student achievement, right? So instead of categorizing students according to what they can't do, or maybe we should even say can't yet do, think instead about what they can do, what they're working to do, what they're learning. Moving into reading, one of the things I'd really like to see change in schools, I would like to see more teachers working on language development for students. You know, right now in the professional learning experiences that I lead for teachers, 
a lot of times we see the ESL teacher or the ESOL teacher or the bilingual instructional coach show up to these professional learning experiences. And it's a little bit of preaching to the choir. Right, right. Where do multilingual students spend most of their day? They're with a content teacher, they're with a classroom teacher. Those are the teachers that we really want to come and learn more about how to support language development. Um, and so within that, I would say reading, if you're a math teacher, read your math textbook, read what students will read. If you're a science teacher, read what a science teacher, scientist or science textbook, what they write, and then just notice the language, right? You don't need to be a linguist or even a grammar lover to notice things like, well, we use a lot of sequential words, words that indicate sequence. Oh, we use past tense a lot. Oh, instead of saying the vase or I broke the vase, it says the vase was broken. Mm -hmm. These are just little things that you can notice when you read how your content area is written. And those are the things you can introduce to your students. Um, and then finally with writing, I would love to see content teachers and classroom teachers, all content areas, writing exemplars to give to their students. This can be a sentence frame that they fill in. So letting your students know when you're comparing two things, here's a sentence frame you can use. I noticed that blank is bigger than blank. Or it could be something bigger, right? You can provide them with a, a model text that they can emulate when they write. Or even a list of key vocabulary words that they can be using in their language when they speak or when they write not only content specific words but also the words that they need to engage in academic conversations it could be something like um, accountable talk right i agree with what you said however i would like to add that kind of language can be provided to students as well so those are some things that i would like to see improve in our schools for our multilingual learners Great. Thanks for outlining all that. And like what I heard a lot of is, you know, valuing and understanding the language repertoires that all of our students bring and understanding it and also understanding what it is that they are taking in or that they're what they're trying to take in via textbooks or, um, you know, what the teacher is putting out there, et cetera. So a lot of it's just sort of understanding what they bring and understanding what you're putting out and where are some dis well, before you talk about disconnects, where the advantages are and the assets are, but then understanding and kind of auditing for where those disconnects are. And that is where, and you mentioned somebody as, as somebody who provides a lot of PD and is talking to a lot of school districts, that is where professional learning becomes really important. And you mentioned that content teachers, you know, sort of aren't the people in the rooms and we want them in the rooms. And I, I totally hear what you're saying about preaching to the choir. Sometimes, you know, when I'm interviewing people and I'm thinking about who's listening to this podcast, I know that a lot of the people that are listening are people who are already engaged in this work. So I get excited when we can reach people who are in the classroom and perhaps working with these students have the pleasure and the, and the, um, you know, the, the, the delight of working with these students, maybe for the first time, they're going to need support. And so my next question, kind of going back to the beginning of what we were talking about, we kind of began with the pandemic and some of the affordances that it, that it, that it brought um, some silver linings. Do you think that this this virtual or blended professional development is going to become more prevalent or are we going to kind of go back to how it was? I mean, that muscle memory and that unlearning is so hard to do. Um, and then what do you kind of circling back to what you just said, the framework and the and the and the foundation that you just gave us on reading, writing, listening and speaking? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each each approach, particularly as they pertain to preparing teachers and really content teachers? Let's talk about that group to work with multilingual learners. That was a mouthful. Hopefully you got all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, a great question. Is virtual PD here to stay? Um, and I think the way you phrased it was perfect. You know, are we going to go back to the way it was? Um, I don't think so. I think virtual PD is here to stay, but I do think we're going to go back to having face-to-face -face PD as well. You know, for a little while, it was virtual or nothing. And now I'm seeing more and more schools and districts being comfortable bringing people in for face-to-face. -face. However, just like businesses in every industry who were forced to try something new, which was remote work during the beginning of the pandemic, as a result of being forced to experience that, they then were able to see the benefits of it. I think that's going to apply here as well, since we were all forced to do either virtual PD or no PD for a certain period of time. That really allowed a lot of schools and districts to see the benefits of it. So I do think it's going to stick around and will be more common than it was pre-pandemic. 
Um, but very important question that I also heard you ask was what are the pros and cons of each one, right? Well, you know, like I said, virtual or blended PD is definitely here to stay. And let me talk about some of the reasons, some of the benefits that we saw from that, right? One is cost. So if I want to bring somebody into my district to do PD, I can't really bring them in just for a one hour PD, right? It's going to have to be at least a whole day. But if I want to do just one hour and maybe that's all I want to pay for, all I can pay for, I can do a one hour virtual PD for my teachers, right? Mm -hmm. um, even if it is a whole day, I'm not paying for travel for the consultant to come out. So the cost is usually a lot lower. Um, if you can compare, you know, the same the same PD face to face versus virtual, it's usually going to be a lot cheaper in terms of cost. Um, scheduling is also going to be a benefit to virtual PD. Uh, right now, um, in the work that I'm doing, we have a model with um, Margarita Calderon and Associates. We're offering um, a year-long PD that we're advertising as a sub-free model. So the current challenge that a lot of schools and districts are facing is a lack of coverage if teachers are out of the classroom, right? So we're, we're back in the classroom, we've got students back in schools, but we're facing this huge sub-shortage and teacher shortage. So it's really hard to provide PD on days when teachers should be or are scheduled to be in the classroom teaching. Um, so if it's face-to-face, -face, you know, are you gonna pay to bring somebody in just to do a couple hours after school? Um, are you gonna be able to schedule all of your PD only on your teacher work days? Well, with a virtual, what you can do is schedule an hour before or after school, even for several days in a row to mm -hmm. maybe cover the same amount of content that you might have gotten in a one day full day PD had it been face to face. Um, it's also a little more flexible, right? If you do need to make a change, it's really a lot more possible to make a change last minute with a virtual PD than with a face to face where you've got people scheduled to come out to your district. Um, another advantage is if you have anybody in your district that needs any accommodations, perhaps they're not quite feeling safe uh, being in the building as often or any more often than they need to be, um, then virtual is a way to provide that accommodation. Or if you have somebody that just can't stay too late after school, maybe they have young children at home, mm -hmm. right? They can go home, be at home, but also be tuned into the PD. Now, in terms of the benefits of face-to-face, Virtual learning is never going to be as good as face-to-face -face learning in terms of the experience itself. Part of this is attention, and I'm not even talking about misbehavior, right? We always have that one person that maybe does not agree with what you're doing or is not has not bought into the PD, and maybe they're not going to pay attention. I'm not even talking about that, right? That's something that's going to happen here and there, no matter how you're providing your PD. And the way to address it is something separate of choosing face-to-face sure, -face or sure. virtual. Yep. But, you know, it's just not that easy to pay attention to a screen, okay? So like I said, it's not even misbehavior. I mean, have you ever been listening to a podcast that you're listening to because you wanted to, you chose to listen to it, and then you realize, wait, I wasn't really paying attention. Let me back it up. Yeah, yeah. I know I do that all the time. I love that backup 30 seconds button right, on my right. podcast, right? Sometimes it even happens when I'm reading. But, and of course, people's attention can can wander no matter what's going on, but it's a lot more likely on a screen. Um, and I know for me, if I have the opportunity to turn my camera off, if I have a lot on my plate, I'm going to be choosing to multitask. Sometimes I think I can do this and pay attention at the same time. But then sometimes I'll realize, oh, I don't, I wasn't listening. Yeah. I don't know what was happening. Yep. Or I'll realize I, I was listening. I just didn't get as much out of it. So face to face, it's also possible to check out <laughs> accidentally or on purpose, but it's a lot less common. It's a lot harder. Um, another benefit of the face to face PD as a presenter is that I can get a lot more richer and more immediate feedback from my audience. So I can really eyeball the whole room a lot more easily than I can scroll through all those little faces on Zoom, right? I can watch for feed uh, body language. I can see whether people are nodding or whether they're sort of, you know, chatting with a friend, maybe indicating they didn't understand what I said. I can get that immediate feedback um, a lot more easily in a face-to-face -face experience. And then as a learner, if you're in a PD with me and we're face-to-face, 
you also are going to get a lot more out of it simply because I'm right there in front of you. I'm able to respond more immediately, answer questions here or there. Um, it's just a lot faster and more richer communication between the, the facilitator and the learners in a face-to-face -face PD. So now that we've all been forced to do virtual PD and sort of see some of those benefits, I do think it's going to stick around. But also now that we're back in school buildings, now that you know we're past the stage where gatherings were not allowed like they were in the very beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. I do think we're going to continue to see face-to-face -face PD as well. And my hope is that going forward, each individual school or district or teacher is going to be able to choose the format that works best for them for that particular experience. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the headline, right? Is being able to kind of choose what works for you both individually and having kind of a menu of sorts that 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 you can choose from. And then of course, on a larger scale, different schools and different districts are going to have different needs um, and different phases that we've seen kind of within when people can be in school all the time and when they need to be out, et cetera. So we need to have kind of more contingency plans than we than we've ever had before. Um, so you just did a good job kind of outlining the affordances of both and kind of what they bring to the table. And, and again, kind of concluded with, it depends on what the district needs. But regardless of what kind of uh, delivery method or modality the, the school um, decides to use or the district decides to use, they have, let's say, the, the in-person space in place or they have the, the online space in place and all the tools they need. What else do school leaders and administrators need right now? And let's stipulate that they have the tech stuff and they have the, the in-person stuff all set, all set. But what do they need to implement high quality, sustainable, job embedded, everything that all the research shows, which, which is you know, good for a high quality PD. What do they need to do all that for their teachers to best support their multilingual learners? Excellent question. And, and you said it right, it, it needs to be high quality, sustainable, and job embedded, you know, and sustainable and sustained. These are some of the characteristics that I'd love to see. Um, we all know that a, a one-shot PD, you know, do a workshop for a full day and then we're done, is not going to have the same impact as that sustained learning. Um, and yet, unfortunately, sometimes budgeting uh, forces uh, schools or districts to choose just the one day and no more. Uh, but more than that, I think it's it's a mindset, right? So we need to see administrators supporting the professional learning. So when administrators attend the PD along with their teachers, so they understand what their teachers are being asked to do, and then when they keep that in mind, so they sustain it over the school year or beyond, again, whether they're bringing PD in over and over again or not, even if it is just a one day workshop and that's all, which is the least <laughs> that we can do, administrators can still set the expectation that that learning be implemented and they can continue to support teachers learning, even if it's just through PLCs or book studies within the district. Um, so again, regardless of what you can do with budget or with time, I think the most important thing to do to make sure that that PD is a high quality, sustainable experience for your teachers is to maintain that learning throughout the year and beyond. But ideally, it won't be just a one day workshop and then the administrator on their own or the district leadership on their own trying to sustain this. Ideally, it will be, as you said, job embedded learning. So mm -hmm. the best model is to see somebody come in, do a workshop, have the teachers, you know, engage with that new learning, follow it up with some opportunity for teachers to reflect on and give feedback on what they learned and interact with each other. And then after that, follow it up with that job embedded support where teachers are in the classroom implementing what they've learned and then receiving feedback on it. Um, and I really think it comes back to that mindset as well that we talked about in terms of who needs these PD experiences, yeah. right? So we really want to see content teachers with the mindset that supporting their students' language development will result in students learning their content better. So it's not an either or, right? It's not, I'm either a math teacher or a language teacher. I'm either a science teacher or a language teacher. I, I as a math teacher, need to be supporting my students' development of the language that we use when we talk about, read about, and write about math. And the same goes for every other content area as well. 
Um, so I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm trying to go back to things that administrators or school or district leadership can do regardless of what the actual budget, the actual schedule, the actual program models look like, right? Yeah, so I'm kind yeah. of taking it back to the mindset because then going from there, if you can add on to that, you know, bringing in some experts or scheduling some coaching or, you know, having the time for a lot of intensive uh, work with your teachers, that's great. But it's really all going to start with that mindset of, you know, what do I want my teachers to be doing? How am I going to support them with my mindset? And then how am I going to hold them accountable for implementing what they've learned? Yeah, so I, like a bit of a follow up there. And I think one of the biggest challenges, <clears throat> at least for me as a teacher, and what I've seen um, is I, I've been to a lot of PD, and I've given a lot of PD um, that I hope the PD that I was given was inspirational, but I can certainly think of PD sessions that I've been in. Well, I can think of ones that were just not good, a lot of those, but I can think of a few that were like really amazing. They inspired me. They made me think differently. I went back to my classroom. I thought about some different things to do, but the disconnect for me was that it, I, I, there wasn't a bridge to my own students. Like to my, to, I wasn't able to really like make a complete, lead connection over time with the students that I was serving that were in front of me. Have you seen that being successfully done, particularly as it pertains to like content teachers, having some kind of professional development, professional learning, continuous experience, where they're constantly going back to looking at their own students, their performance over time, their data, et cetera? Yeah, great question there as well. Um, so first of all, I just want to affirm what you said. Absolutely. Any professional learning experience that a teacher is engaged with really needs to be applicable to their own classroom, their own students. And that connection should not only be there, but should be made clear and explicit to the teachers that are in that PD. So in terms of how to do that, you know, ideally teachers will be bringing with them their lesson plans or their texts that they teach from or their student work, right? And in the workshop itself, connecting what they're learning to that. You know, we always like to see professional development that includes two things. One is interaction, right? Mm -hmm. We don't like to do any type of professional development that involves the expert speaking to the teachers and that's it. Right. We always want to see the learners interacting among themselves. This is sort of just a bare minimum for good professional development. Exactly what we want our classes to look like, by the way, is it, talking to what you were talking about earlier uh, in, the, in, the, in the episode. Exactly, yeah. Well, we always try to practice what we preach and model for our teachers how we want them to be teaching as well. That's funny. That's actually one of my, my jokes that I make a lot of times is uh, at the beginning of a PD, I will let people know this is going to be interactive because why would I stand up here and lecture you about how I don't want you to stand up and lecture your yeah, students? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the other sort of bare minimum for any good PD on any topic is that it needs to be, there needs to be application, right? So participants need an opportunity to apply what they've learned. And this looks like different things in different good workshops that I've attended, right? Sometimes it can be, um, sort of a case study where the, the presenter will say, you know, here's a student, here's what's happening. You know, what do you think? How would you respond to this? And this is very useful if you have a mixed group or if you're doing some PD over the summer. So while, while teachers don't actually have their students in front of them, it still gives them that, that real life experience of thinking, you know, how would I meet this student's needs? Um, another way is just, like I said, have teachers bring their lesson plans or instruct them, say, okay, I've taught you this method or these steps or this model, whatever it is. Now I want you to take a few minutes and create a lesson plan for your students or one activity for your students or you know, notes on how to teach a text to your students based on what we've learned. So they actually have that experience in the classroom. But then you also talked about taking a little farther, right? Using student data over time. So if we see this really high quality PD, it's going to be sustained over time. It's mm -hmm. not going to be that one workshop. So again, we wanna see teachers applying what they learned in a workshop, even if it's just a one-shot deal, they really need application. But ideally they're gonna be in a sustained professional learning program of some type. And they're gonna have that opportunity to take what they learned back to the classroom, in an ideal situation, they would actually have that coaching experience I described a few minutes ago, where they're in the classroom, 
implementing what they learned, you know, teaching students and then getting feedback on how that went. But with or without that, they should also be coming back to sort of the next workshop experience and saying, here's what happened, sharing the results with the presenter, with other teachers, and then sort of workshopping from there, right? So we'd like to see uh, these professional learning communities where teachers share successes. I tried it, here's what happened, here's why I think it worked so well, as well as helping each other troubleshoot any challenges or problems that they had. Right. Yeah, thanks for indulging me with that. That was kind of a follow-up question. I think it's really important to think about um, and just think about the, the spaces where I saw opportunities for improvement. And I'm sure others do as well. I want to shift gears a little bit um, to talk about something that I know that you feel uh, very strongly about. You've, you've done a lot of work around the language that teachers use to describe their students. You, you alluded to that earlier and you said we'd talk about it a little more and we're going to. Um, so, some of that language can be harmful um, without at times teachers knowing it. So give us some examples of that language um, that educators should avoid and, and how can we change it to be kind of more asset-based? You talked about the example of English learner versus multilingual learner. What are some other ways that we can kind of approach that topic? Absolutely. So I'm actually going to shift the question a little bit because I actually don't want to have a list of terms that teachers should avoid. Instead, I'd like to encourage teachers to think about how the language they use might impact students or themselves. So I'll talk about some examples, but it actually goes a little bit farther than just avoiding certain terms. And it really is going to come back to just being a little more mindful mm -hmm. and a little more intentional when we describe our students. Great. I like that um, better. I like that approach better. Go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So first of all, you know, I mentioned a couple earlier, right? Like talking about those kids um, or talking about the low kids or using words like can't, right? He can't do this type of math. She can't speak English, things like that. So first of all, I think one of the things that's easiest to see is if your students hear you using that type of language to describe them, how will they think about themselves, right? And we certainly don't want our students to show up to school believing that they can't do anything, right? Just as teachers, that's sort of our job is to say, absolutely, you can. You are going to learn it. I'm going to help you learn it. And we're going to get there, whatever it is that we're teaching. Um, so, so that's the first thing. Think about how your language might impact your students if they hear it. But that's not the only reason that it's important to have a more asset-based rather than deficit-based approach in your language, because the language that you use can also express and also reinforce your expectations of your students. Mm -hmm. So even if your students never heard you saying things like, oh, that student can't read, that student can't speak English, um, that student can't behave, you yourself, by using that language, are still perpetuating some of these deficit-based ideas, some of these limiting ideas about our students. So I really encourage everyone, take even the most extreme example where you think there's no way I could change this language, and then try it. Come up with an asset-based version of it instead and see how it, you know, how it paints a different picture. So if you have a student, let's say a student who can't, read on grade level. We'll start there, right? We'll start with this deficit-based language. So I'm going to sort of play devil's advocate a little. As a teacher, I might say, well, I don't want to sugarcoat that. I don't want to dance around that because that's an important fact about this student that tells me what I as a teacher need to do, right? And then I would come back and I would say, well, then let's focus on that instead. Let's say that that student is working on reading on grade level. Okay, so we haven't sugarcoated it, right? Uh, it's not a euphemism. We're not saying the same thing, but making it sound better. We've actually shifted from a statement about right now, right? The student can't do anything, um, which is only relevant right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because as a teacher, we're interested in where are we going and how are we going to get there? So when we shift from saying the student can't read on grade level to the student is working on reading on grade level, we're focused on what we're doing right? And that's going to be a true statement over a longer period of time because can't is very absolute, right? And between can't read on grade level and can read on grade level, 
there's a lot of gray area, right? There's a lot of places where a student can be with their reading ability that's not exactly, well, they can't do it at all, but it's also not they are absolutely meeting grade level standards or expectations for reading. So by saying we are, the student is working on reading on grade level, we're being more accurate. So I'm, that's, that's my devil's advocate and then my response to the devil's advocate. I did use the example of can't read because I think that applies in a lot of contexts. Um, but of course, when we're talking specifically about multilingual learners, a lot of times it's can't speak English, right? Um, and I would say the same thing would apply. Rather than can't speak English and can speak English, let's focus on that journey. Let's say the student is working on speaking English. And luckily, you know, some of the different organizations that we have, like WIDA, has given us the language for that, right? We can say the student is at the intermediate level of proficiency in English. But that's still one level, right? We're still looking at a journey from can't to can. Sure. And and you you actually use that same almost approach for uh, as it pertains to to teachers, to working with teachers. I mean, so you think about, um, for example, uh, a content teacher who maybe has never worked with multilingual learners before because the demographic has shifted and now, all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're get, seeing an uptick in, in, in multilingual learners and they need to get better, but they know that they have, they have to improve. So how do you, how do you take that asset-based approach when it comes to delivering professional learning to teachers who are ready, willing, and able to learn, but may, may this may be deficit-based, lack some of the skills that they need to, to, to approach it? Definitely, Steve. This actually comes out of a pet peeve of mine. So when I first started working with professional learning for teachers, rather than just working with teaching students, it's something that I noticed that all the professional learning people would, you know, they would talk about how we should view our students and how we should talk about our students. And it was all, you know, asset based and really more positive. But then at the same time, there would be some people who would use that same deficit-based language that they didn't want anyone using for students, they would use that language about the teachers they work with. Well, you know how some teachers are. Oh, I got a group of those teachers today. <laughs> and I just noticed that that was having that same limiting effect on our ability as facilitators of professional learning sure. to support teachers in their learning it was having that same limiting effect that it that it does when teachers use that language about students and then limit what students are able to achieve. Um, so it's actually something that I try to do and I encourage participants in my professional learning experiences to call me out on if they see me doing it differently. But again, it's not just about language, right? It's about how I think about these teachers and the one can reinforce the other. So my first shift is to try to really keep in mind um, that no matter who I work with, no matter how resistant they seem to some ideas, no matter how overwhelmed and exasperated they are with the situation that they have in their school, which since the pandemic, of course, that's been much more. Of course. But I need to remember that these are people here that are learning, that are doing their best at any given moment. And if they could be doing better, then I'm here to help them with that, right? Not here to condemn them and to decide that they, oh, that teacher will never be able to work with multilingual learners or that teacher just will not believe that these students can achieve more, but rather, you know, to see them as they are. I mean, every single teacher in this country is doing this job for some reason other than money, mm -hmm. <laughs> first of all, mm -hmm. we know that. And so I think teachers more than anyone else deserve more credit than they sometimes get. You know, we hear a lot about uh, parents complaints about teachers or since the pandemic, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, teachers were heroes. And since then they faced so much from the general public and from politicians, you know, they're dealing with so much. I think it's really important to view teachers as doing the best that they can. And on top of that, really choosing a career path that is all about service. And so I think that can also help us remember, even on days when a teacher is not doing their best, that they're doing the best they can in that moment and that we're here to help them forward. Yeah, that kind of brings us full circle to like the the cycle of, you know, the, the students and teachers and making sure that we're practicing what we're preaching um, as providers of professional development or professional learning. Um, and that's, that's, as we kind of wrap up here, that's probably a good note to to end kind of the bulk of the conversation on, but I have two more questions for you that I, that I ask everyone and they're important questions. The first one 
um, is so that we can have this kind of library of of books. And we we just sent out our summer reading list. So this is a this is an apropos question. They all come from um, guests' recommendations. So I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody, and that is, is there a book or other resource that's kind of influenced you? either personally or professionally that you'd like to share with listeners? Sure, I actually have two. So one is we can't teach what we don't know, white teachers, multiracial schools by my good friend and colleague, Gary R. Howard. I had the great honor of being able to work with him briefly when I was at Corwin. Um, And this book is one of the ones that really helped me see my own racial privilege um, and also dig in a little bit more to my racial identity and how that impacts the students and the teachers that I work with. So I would greatly uh, suggest this. I know there's been a lot of anti-racism books that got really popular, especially after the summer of George Floyd. Uh, This one is a little bit older, but it's one of my favorites. It's also not too long. Great. And then the other one that I'd like to suggest is High Expectations Teaching by John Safir. Um, This book really surprised me with how much I learned from it, including the history of the IQ test in the United States. Oh, yeah. Um, But also, it really digs in a lot to um, how much having high expectations and believing in our students can impact their achievement. Yeah, something we addressed today with both uh, with both teachers and students. That's great. Those are two books that have not been recommended, which is always great when they're new ones. So thank you. Um, Last question, Letitia, and this is an important one. We just kind of scraped the surface of the work that you're doing. and, And certainly, there's lots of folks that enjoy reading and exploring um, uh, topics in different ways other than listening. So how can people learn more about the work that you're doing? Oh, thank you, Steve. That's a great question. Um, So I am on Twitter, but I do tweet about a variety of things, including my personal life. Uh, So you can find a mix of (laughs) professional takes and also just what my cat is up to. Um, Just at at Letitia Trower. (laughs) Yeah, so on Twitter, it's just at Letitia Trower. Um, but you can also read my bio and see a little bit more about the work that I do with professional learning um, on the website for Dr. Margarita Calderon and Associates, which is excel.com. And I'll spell it out. It's E-X-C hyphen E-L-L dot com. So there you can see uh, just a list of the professional development offerings that we have that we offer through that organization, as well as, like I said, my bio, there actually happen to be a lot of free resources for teachers on that website as well. Great. And we will link to all of that information, both on the show notes and on the blog post that will come out of this episode as well. And with that, Letitia, it's been a pleasure chatting with you as usual. I'm glad we finally made it happen. And um, let's continue collaborating. Thanks so much, Steve.